Good morning, past presidents, council members of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, president and the council members of Yakna Medical Association, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the Sir Marcus Fernando oration, which will be delivered by Professor Dayani Tilakaratna. Professor Dayani Tilakaratna is the Associate Professor at the Division of Infectious Diseases, Department of Medicine, Duke University School of Medicine in Durham, USA. Assistant, she, ha she has been also the Assistant Research Professor at the Duke Global Health Institute of Durham and also an adjunct professor at the Department of Medicine, Faculty of Medicine, University of Ruhuna in Sri Lanka. Uh, she, has, she has also been a co-director of Ruhuna Duke Center for Infectious Diseases, Faculty of Medicine, University of Ruhuna. Uh, she had her <coughs> uh, Bachelor's uh, of Science in uh, 2003. She graduated from Massachusetts Institute of Technology and also MD from Duke University School of Medicine. And also she has an MSc from the same university, Duke University in Global Health, uh, in, uh, she obtained in 2014. She has had extensive professional training as a uh, intern and resident in internal medicine from 2007 to 2010 at the University of Pennsylvania Hospital and the hospital uh, and also Global uh, Duke Global Health Institute, uh, she has been a fellow in global health. She has extensive uh, uh, number of pub publications, uh, over 48 publications in international peer-reviewed journals, including two which are under review, and over 65 abstracts presented at national and international conferences. And the subjects cover uh, access to COVID-19 diagnostics in uh, community-engaged research, as well as effect, cost-effectiveness analysis of pneumo pneumococcal conjugate vaccine implementation into the National Immunization Program in Sri Lanka, and also antibacterial utilization for febrile illnesses and laboratory-confirmed bloodstream infections in northern Tanzania, and also um, access to COVID-19 testing by individuals with housing insecurity during the early days of COVID-19 pandemic in the United States, uh, that's which is a scoping review and also um, another published paper uh, i have selected a few uh, priorities and progress in diagnostic research by antibacterial by the antibacterial resistance leadership group uh, in the uh, clinical infectious diseases uh, journal she has won numerous awards which included starting from young investigator award in 2007 uh, at the Conference on Retrovirus and Opportunistic Infections, an epidemiology and epidemiology elective program centers for disease control and prevention in 2007. And uh, in 2011, Mary E. Groff Fellowship in Clinical Research Methods, University of Pennsylvania. And in 2013, Fogarty Global Health Fellowship Award. And 2015, European Congress of Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases Travel Award. And in 2016, Hubert Jürgen Center for Global Health Career Development Award and uh, numerous other awards and uh, more recent ones in Sri Lanka's Women Leaders Award uh, given by, uh, C awarded by CMO Asia World Women's Leadership Congress. And in 2020, uh, she has been made a Fellow of Infectious Diseases Society of America. It's my great pleasure and honor to invite Professor uh, Gaini Tilakaratna to deliver the Sir Marcus Fernando Oration 2023 on the subject Reducing Antibiotic Presentations for Viral Acute Respiratory Infections in Sri Lanka. Thank you very much, Dr. Arya Rathna, for your kind words of introduction. And a very good morning to everyone. The President and the Council of the Sri Lanka Medical Association and the Jaffna Medical Association the guest of honor, Dr. Palitha Abekhun, Chief Guest, Professor Samat Dharmaratne, past presidents, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's a tremendous honor to deliver the Sir Marcus Fernando oration today. First, some words about the life and work of Sir Marcus Fernando. 
He was an exemplary physician, diagnostician, and teacher with a special interest in tropical diseases. Thus, it's apt that the current presentation is related to infectious diseases. Carmarcus was born in 1864 and received his primary education at St. Benedict's College and then Royal College. He was a brilliant scholar who was awarded the Gilchrist Scholarship for the East in 1882 and the Ceylon Government Scholarship in 1883. Carmarcus entered University College London and was the first student from Ceylon to study medicine. He made remarkable progress, obtaining many awards and honors. He qualified in 1888 with the Bachelor of Medicine, obtaining the University Gold Medal in Medicine and Forensic Medicine. <laughs> the following year, he obtained his MD and was made a fellow of University College, the first Ceylon graduate to be so honored. In 1891, he returned to Ceylon and joined the Government Medical Service. He was later appointed senior physician to the Columbia General Hospital and lecturer in medicine in the college. At the age of 45, having reached the peak of his chosen profession, Dr. Marcus Fernando resigned from government medical service and devoted a major part of his energies to interests in agriculture, economics, and politics. His list of achievements is exhaustive and includes many distinguished positions such as president of the Ceylon Economic Society, island magistrate, chairman of the boards of two banks, director and later owner of a newspaper, and member of the banking commission that led to the formation of the Bank of Ceylon. His services were duly recognized by knighthood in 1923, giving him the singular honor of being the first Sri Lankan medical professional to be knighted. At the age of 71 in 1953, Sir Marcus Fernando departed from this world, leaving behind a legacy that to date stands unparalleled and unchallenged. And it's my honor to deliver this oration in his memory. Acute respiratory tract infections uh, account for some of the most common infections that we see globally. These include upper respiratory infections, which are infections above the level of the larynx. So conditions like sinusitis and pharyngitis, as well as lower respiratory tract infections. Uh, which are infections below the level of the larynx, conditions like pneumonia and bronchitis. In 2019, the Global Burden of Disease Study estimated that there were 17.2 billion cases of upper respiratory infection and 489 million cases of lower respiratory tract infection. I note that this was before the COVID-19 pandemic. So with almost 18 billion cases of re acute respiratory infection yearly, it's clear that uh, these infections account for substantial morbidity and mortality around the world. Most of us in this room probably experience at least one episode of acute respiratory infections uh, annually. And so better diagnosing and managing these conditions is essential. Acute respiratory infections, as you probably know, can be caused by bacteria, viruses, or less commonly fungi. It's widely accepted that over 90% of upper respiratory infections are caused by viruses. Uh, some of the common culprit viruses are influenza, SARS coronavirus 2. You can see the others listed here. In the past, lower respiratory tract infections were thought to be mostly caused by bacteria, but there are emerging data from important cohort studies that suggest otherwise. Uh, one of these seminal studies is the PERT study, which enrolled almost 2,000 children less than five years of age who were hospitalized in pneumonia in Asia and Africa. And in this study, 61% of cases were caused by viruses, while just 27% were caused by bacteria. Another such seminal study is the EPIC study, which was conducted in the US, and that enrolled over 5,000 children and adults hospitalized with pneumonia. In this study, 66% of cases were caused by viruses and 8% by bacteria in children. And among adults, 24% were caused by viruses and 11% by bacteria. And most patients actually did not have an etiology identified despite comprehensive testing. So the exact numbers seem to vary depending on the cohort and the setting. But we can conclude that 
a high proportion of lower respiratory infections are also caused by viruses. In the southern province, uh, over the last decade, our team has been working on identifying or improving the diagnosis and management of acute respiratory tract infections, among other many other areas, areas of study. Um, and this work has been conducted through the Duke Ruhina Collaborative Research Center, which was established in 2006. This is a partnership between the Faculty of Medicine, University of Ruhina in Gaul, and Duke University in Durham, North Carolina in the US. And again, this is a research, educational, and clinical partnership. And over the last decade, we have conducted many studies related to acute respiratory infections. And so I'll share with you some of the data we have generated from our studies um, for the remainder of this talk. The majority of our data have been generated at Chichen Hospital Karakitia, which is the largest public tertiary care hospital in uh, Southern province with over 1800 beds. And we have been fortunate to enroll multiple large cohorts of patients in both the inpatient and outpatient settings to better understand the etiology and epidemiology of acute respiratory infection. From 2012 to 2014, we enrolled 976 patients who were hospitalized with acute febrile illness. So these were patients who had fever, but no other localizing signs or symptoms. We conducted comprehensive gold standard testing for common pathogens. And we also conducted multiplex PCR of nasopharyngeal swabs for respiratory pathogens. And these are the results. Um, as expected, the plurality of cases uh, were due to dengue, 37.1%. We also identified a substantial proportion with leptospirosis, rickettsial infections. About a third of cases were unidentified, which is common in such studies. And interestingly, um, a surprisingly high proportion, almost 16%, when you account for viral co-infections, actually had respiratory viruses identified. Uh, the most common respiratory viruses were influenza A, influenza B, parainfluenza virus, and respiratory syncytial virus. In 2013 to 2015, we conducted another study enrolling 571 outpatients. These were patients who were presenting with acute respiratory illness, so fever and acute cough to the OPD at Karapitya. Amongst these patients, 63.6% .6 tested positive for a respiratory virus. About a third, again, did not have an etiology identified. And the most common viruses were influenza A, influenza B, human rhinovirus, enterovirus, and respiratory syncytial virus. In 2018 to 2021, we enrolled another large cohort, uh, this time 1,268 patients who were hospitalized with lower respiratory tract infection. And note that this was uh, during this time, patients with COVID were still being admitted to special isolation hospitals. So we didn't actually have any patients with COVID within this cohort. Despite this, 41.7% had a respiratory virus identified which is about 10% more than those who had a bacterial etiology identified. And the most common viruses were influenza A, influenza B, human rhinovirus, enterovirus, and respiratory syncytial virus. And then more recently, um, we initiated another study again of patients with lower respiratory tract infection who are hospitalized at Karapitya. Um, and in this patient, so far, in this study, we have so far enrolled 308 patients, and about 48.7% uh, tested positive for a respiratory virus. Uh, most common viruses were influenza A and B, human rhinovirus, enterovirus, and uh, SARS coronavirus. Too. Some of these cases may represent asymptomatic colonization. But it's clear that respiratory viruses are a very common cause of illness in uh, southern Sri Lanka. And so we looked at how these illnesses are being treated. Let's look at antibiotic use. Um, in the study of patients with acute febrile illness, in those who had a positive viral test, which is 155 patients, 55.2% uh, received antibiotics while hospitalized. In the second study of outpatients with acute respiratory illness, 
77.1% received an antibiotic prescription while they were in the OPD. In the study of patients hospitalized with lower respiratory tract infection, 86.8% received uh, antibiotics while hospitalized. And then more recently, um, in our study of lower respiratory tract infection, among those who tested positive for viral etiology, 97.3% received antibiotics while in the hospital. So we can conclude that antibiotic for respiratory viral illnesses is also common. And the reasons for this are multifactorial and also understandable. Viral and bacterial illnesses both present with fever, cough, shortness of breath. They are clinically indistinguishable. And so when facing a patient with an acute respiratory infection, a clinician can't really distinguish between a viral or a bacterial infection based on clinical signs alone. And so they may err on the side of prescribing an antibiotic for fear of missing a lethal bacterial infection. But this antibiotic use comes at a cost. Adverse effects like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, allergic skin reactions, they have been noted in up to 20% of patients who are receiving antibiotics in the hospital. Antibiotic resistance is a natural consequence of the use and certainly the overuse of antibiotics. Um, in 2019, there were almost 5 million deaths that were associated with antibiotic resistant infections, with 1.27 million of these deaths being directly attributable to the infection being a resistant one. This figure shows the distribution of deaths um, and you can see that low or middle income countries actually face the greatest burden of deaths due to antimicrobial resistance. And I don't know if you can see clearly, but South Asia actually faces the highest burden of deaths. And then there's emerging evidence that antibiotic use, especially early on in life, is associated with gut dysbiosis and chronic diseases that develop later on in life. And we heard about this in the prior excellent lecture. Uh, and these are conditions like uh, metabolic diseases, like obesity and diabetes, digestive diseases, like inflammatory bowel disease and colorectal cancer, and allergic diseases like asthma, allergic rhinitis, and atopic dermatitis. There's much research that's still ongoing in these areas. So how do we do, go about improving antibiotic use for acute respiratory infection? There are three pillars that we can think about. One is preventing these infections from occurring in the first place. Two would be trying to improve the diagnosis of these infections. And three would be trying to better target appropriate quality assured treatment. Over the last decade or so, our team has been mostly focusing on trying to improve the diagnosis of acute respiratory infections. More recently, we have delved, delved into some work in prevention mostly related to conducting cost-effectiveness analyses of vaccines. And so I'll share with you the results from this body of work um, for the remainder of this talk. And then at the end, um, as future directions, I'll mention work that we're conducting in all three realms. So can diagnostics help? Early on, we wanted to see if providing access to rapid diagnostics tests could help reduce antibiotic prescriptions. So I mentioned the study with 571 outpatients with acute respiratory illness who are coming to the OPD. Um, we, con we collected one nasopharyngeal swab, conducted multiplex PCR testing with results as I showed you previously. We also collected a second nasopharyngeal swab and we used that one for rapid influenza testing using the Veritor Who A and B assay. This provides a result of influenza A or B in 15 minutes and it has a uh, sensitivity and specificity upwards of 90%. This graph shows um, the patients who tested positive for influenza by the rapid test over the course of the study. 40% uh, of patients tested positive for influenza. And we actually only released results from the rapid influenza testing to patients and physicians during the second half of the study. We again wanted to see if the result would impact antibiotic prescriptions. And we found out that it did. Antibiotic prescriptions dropped from 83.7% in those who had influenza to 62.3% in those uh, in the second uh, phase. 
And so there was a statistically significant drop uh, from phase one to phase two in the patients who had influenza. But uh, the fact of the matter remains that over 50% of patients with a positive rapid influenza test, even when the physician had the result, received an antibiotic prescription. Why was this the case? We next conducted a qualitative study of physicians in the OPD, and we interviewed both physicians as well as patients who were presenting with acute respiratory illness. When we talked to physicians, they, um, they perceived that patients desired antibiotic prescriptions or capsules, which is a common formulation of antibiotics in the, given in the OPD. And they cited patient demand as one of the reasons for antibiotic overuse. This is a representative quote. Medically not indicated, but we had to weigh the conditions and the patient. Some patients, they are coming while they are going to work. They are finding day-to-day -day income. They said, sir, there's no capsule given here. They are experienced. They need some form of capsules. When we talked to patients, on the other hand, they said they wanted medications, but the more medications being better, but they didn't necessarily want antibiotics, um, and most of them actually didn't know what antibiotics were. So there was a bit of a disconnect there. Physicians also said that fear of bacterial co-infection and superinfection drew antibiotic prescriptions, even in the face of a positive respiratory viral test. And these are some of the representative quotes from the physicians. Viral ones we sometimes treat with some antibacterial cover-up, otherwise they will develop secondary bacterial infections. For viral, joint pain, backache, loss of appetite are common. If I'm sure, then I don't use an antibiotic. If I'm not sure, I often use an antibiotic. So these results again suggest that education of both patients and physicians in the setting could be helpful. Uh, further, identification of a viral infection by itself may not be sufficient. A bacterial infection has to be excluded to impact antibiotic prescriptions even more. So we felt that this was a setting in which post-based diagnostics may play an important role. Post-based diagnostics assess the host's immune response to infection to classify the cause of infection as bacterial or viral broadly. And the most uh, well-known, widely used post-based diagnostics for acute respiratory infection are probably C-reactive protein and procalcitonin. These are protein biomarkers that rise in the setting of bacterial infection. CRP is increased in the setting of IL-6 secretion by macrophages and T cells. And procalcitonin is increased by lipopolysaccharide, microbial toxins, IL-6, and TNF-alpha. But the performance characteristics of protein biomarkers can also be limited. And so we studied this um, in 76 patients with acute febrile respiratory illness. We looked at commonly used thresholds. And CRP at 10 milligrams per liter had a sensitivity of 100% and specificity of 34% for bacterial infections. And at a cutoff of 20 milligrams per liter, it again had a sensitivity of 100% for bacterial infection and slightly improved specificity at 50%. When you look at procalcitonin, 0.25 is the threshold that's used commonly for acute respiratory infection. And it had a sensitivity of 100% and specificity of 41% for bacterial infection. And at a higher threshold of 0.5 nanograms per milliliter, sensitivity was 90% and specificity was slightly improved at 68%. So these biomarkers do have an important role to play in diagnosing acute respiratory infections, but clearly better diagnostics are needed. So instead of uh, just looking at protein biomarkers, you can look at gene expression. Uh, across the genome uh, to look at genes that may be differentially expressed in bacterial versus viral infections. So the concept is that certain genes may be upregulated or downregulated in different fashions, um, and you can pull out the set of genes that's most differentially expressed into what's known as a gene expression classifier. And this can help diagnose bacterial versus viral infection. We have been working in conjunction with the Center for Infectious Diagnostics and Innovation at Duke University 
to help develop some of these classifiers to distinguish bacterial versus viral acute respiratory infection. The methodology is somewhat complex, but includes RNA extraction followed by sequencing, and then complex, complex statistical methods um, that select the genes that are most differentially expressed to accurately identify bacterial versus viral infection. And uh, at Duke, we have developed two such classifiers, one for viral infection, consisting of 33 genes, one for bacterial infection, consisting of 71 genes. Um, and this was tested in 317 patients in the US with acute respiratory illness. And overall accuracy was 87%. And you can see the performance metrics, um, sensitivity and specificity of both classifiers for bacterial and viral infection were pretty high. Um, very impressive, actually. Um, and certainly superior to the protein biomarker performance. Uh, how do these gene expression classifiers perform in patients in Sri Lanka who have a different genetic background? We assessed this question as well in 79 patients with fever and respiratory symptoms. Uh, we included 58 with viral infection and 21 with bacterial infection. And you can see that when we apply the classifiers, the viral infection shown in red separate out nicely from the bacterial infection shown in green. And these are the formal performance metrics. Uh, for the viral model, sensitivity was 92%, specificity 86%. For the bacterial model, sensitivity was 91%, specificity was 97%. So again, uh, fairly impressive performance characteristics in a population here as well. Uh, and overall accuracy of these classifiers for differentiating between these two types of infections was 94%. At Duke, we have been working on translating these classifiers to rapid platforms. Uh, the, these use real-time PCR. Uh, on the, the platforms use real-time PCR, and onto those, the reduced set of genes is trans translated. And we assess the performance of um, one of these rapid diagnostics on the BioPAR film array platform uh, in the US again in 334 patients presenting with fever and respiratory symptoms, uh, 49 with bacterial infection and 285 with viral infection. Again, bacterial and viral infection separated out pretty well. And these are the performance characteristics uh, for bacterial infection sensitivity was 89.9%, specificity was 82.1%. So slightly decreased from before on this rapid platform, but still um, fairly impressive uh, performance characteristics. So I've described a lot of work in diagnostics. And one of the questions that we always face and one that our team has been grappling with is whether diagnostics can be cost-effective. Strategies that use testing, uh, whether rapid or not, tend to be prohibitively cost um, cost prohibitive, um, especially in low resource settings. Uh, but it's important to think beyond just the cost of the test. In the US alone, it's estimated that the annual cost of six types of antibiotic resistant infections costs $4.6 billion uh, just uh, every year. And then globally, the cost of antibiotic resistant infections by 2050 is, associated, um, is estimated to be $100 trillion. So these are very large costs that's just related to antibiotic resistance. When you think about chronic diseases like diabetes, obesity, that may also be associated with antibiotics. The, the direct societal cost of using antibiotics um, may be even greater. So next, we used. Um, there, there are no formal estimates of the direct societal cost of antibiotic resistance or using antibiotics for Sri Lanka. So we use some of the estimates for other countries like US and Thailand to estimate a societal cost of antibiotic resistance for Sri Lanka. And then we adjusted for antibiotic use in humans versus animals, in the outpatient versus inpatient setting, public versus private sector, uh, to arrive at a cost per antibiotic prescription for antibiotics pres prescribed in the outpatient department for acute respiratory illness. And this cost per prescription is $12.50 when you use $2,017 with a range of $1.60 to $28.70. And so our testing strategy where 
an antibiotic prescription is awarded and which cost $12.50 could still be considered cost effective. So armed with this, this data um, and this estimate of $12.50, we assess the cost effectiveness of implementing this basic influenza testing in the OPD. We use prior estimates of disease burden and the impact of the rapid influenza test uh, from our prior studies. And we compared three diagnostic strategies. The comparative was standard care. And the first diagnostic strategy was clinical predictors. So looking at signs and symptoms that may be more predictive of influenza, again, based on our prior studies. Uh, we also compared a strategy of targeted rapid influenza testing where only certain patients who have characteristics that are more suggestive of influenza would get testing performed. And then we also compared with universal rapid influenza testing where every patient with acute respiratory infection who walks into the OPD gets uh, rapid flu testing performed. With the clinical predictor strategy, the cost per antibiotic prescription awarded would be $3. So compared to our estimate of $12.50, this um, would be considered cost-effective. The targeted testing strategy, uh, for that, the cost for antibiotic prescription avoided was $49. And with the universal rapid influenza testing, the cost for antibiotic prescription avoided was $138. So these testing-based strategies uh, would not be considered cost-effective. We estimated for targeted testing, the test price must really be below $2.60 for the testing strategy to be considered cost-effective. Again, using $2,017. And if we use the higher estimate of $20.70 as the cost per prescription avoided, then a test price must be less than $7.70 to be considered cost-effective. And that's, I think, a more reasonable price for a test. Um, these, these numbers are all estimates, uh, but we hope that these numbers can be helpful to policymakers so that they can make evidence-based decisions about implementing diagnostics-based strategies. So that's the description of our work on diagnosis. And then moving on just a bit to prevention, the National Influenza, or sorry, the National Immunization Program in Sri Lanka has a very impressive record of achieving over 95% coverage of vaccines in the expanded program on immunization. But two vaccines uh, for acute, uh, acute respiratory infections, namely Streptococcus pneumoniae and influenza, are not part of the National Immunization Program. So we performed cost effectiveness analyses just to assess the impact and cost of implementing uh, these two vaccines here. First, with regards to pneumococcal vaccine, we used a static Markov model and looked at a Sri Lankan birth cohort and estimated the incremental cost effectiveness ratio of pneumococcal vaccination versus no vaccination across 101 year cycles. And we use one-way and probabilistic sensitivity analyses using Monte Carlo simulations to assess for parameter uncertainty. And these are some of the outcomes we looked at, acute otitis media, pneumonia, bacteremia, meningitis, and complete recovery. And we assessed uh, implementing two different strategies, PCV10 and PCV13, using a 3 plus 1 vaccine schedule. So the vaccines would be given at two, four, and six months, as well as a booster dose at 12 to 15 months. And these are our estimates. There would be 4.8 million pneumococcal episodes that would be prevented, and 13, oh, sorry, 16,000 deaths that would be prevented over a 100-year one, period using the PCV10 vaccine. For the PCV13 vaccine, 5 million pneumococcal episodes and 22,000 deaths would be prevented, again, over the course of 100 years. The highly cost-effective threshold is defined as the incremental cost-effectiveness cost ratio being below one-fold GDP per capita per quality-adjusted life year gained. In $2020, $2020 
this threshold would be $3,682. And using this threshold, PCB13 would be favored 57% of the time. So the vaccination strategy would be considered cost-effective. Note that for our analyses, many of the estimates are from other countries in Asia because those data for Sri Lanka do not exist in a rigorous fashion. This is a point that I'll come back to later. As more data become available, we can update our analyses uh, with results that may be more locally relevant. So then we also looked at the cost effectiveness of implementing the influenza vaccine. Again, we used a static Markov model and assessed our Sri Lankan population in three age groups, zero to four years, five to 64 years, and over 64 years of age. And we looked at universal and annual influenza vaccination versus no vaccination using 12 monthly cycles um, in a government, governmental perspective at the national level. And again, conducted one-way and probabilistic sensitivity analyses using Monte Carlo simulations. So with universal influenza vaccination, 22,000 episodes would be prevented, 422 hospitalizations would be prevented, and 21 deaths would be prevented per year. And at the highly cost-effective threshold, which in 2022 dollars would be 3,290, universal influenza vaccination was favored 65.2% of the time. So again, would be a favorable implementation strategy. And note again that many of these estimates are from other countries in Asia. And so as more data become available for Sri Lanka, we plan to uh, update our analyses. And in, in terms of conclusion, so I hope I've demonstrated that respiratory viruses are a common cause of illness in Southern Sri Lanka, and that antibiotic use for these respiratory illnesses is common. Rapid diagnostics can be used to reduce antibiotic overuse, and performance of post-based protein biomarker tests is also fair. We haven't assessed the impact of them, but performance at least is fair. Gene expression host-based tests have improved performance characteristics over protein biomarker tests, and they perform well on rap rapid platforms. Diagnostics-based strategies can be cost-effective when you account for societal costs. Again, there are many caveats here, but I think important to be forward-thinking and think about new strategies we can use to um, counteract the problem of antibiotic overuse. And in terms of vaccine cost effectiveness, strep pneumonia and influenza vaccination may be cost effective, but we need better estimates from Sri Lanka. These are the publications that are associated uh, with this oration. Our team has received the President's Awards for Scientific Research for four of the publications associated with this talk. And then I'll end with some future directions. In terms of diagnostics, we are working on moving the gene expression-based test to further rapid platforms. Um, and we are actually planning, uh, we're actually initiating a registrational study to get uh, one of these devices approved in the US and that's starting in the next month. We need to assess the performance of those rapid tests here in Sri Lanka, at least for research purposes and hopefully down the line for clinical purposes. We are also in the process of developing nasopharyngeal based post based assays where instead of a blood sample, we use a nasopharyngeal sample. That may be more feasible in a low resource setting. And in addition, a nasopharyngeal based test affords the possibility of testing for a pathogen like influenza and the host response in a single sample. In terms of our work in prevention, um, I mentioned the two recent cohorts of patients with lower respiratory tract infection that we have enrolled. And we are using um, our results and the diagnostic testing regarding influenza and streptococcus pneumonia to have a better understanding of disease burden, serotypes, clinical outcomes, and costs. And we plan to update our vaccine cost effectiveness analyses with these data. And I should also mention the RSV vaccine that just became available in the US and Europe this year. And early on, less than five years of age, 
RSV may be associated with chronic diseases like asthma. And so looking at the cost effectiveness and impact of, of implementing RSV vaccines, I think would be interesting and important here, as well as COVID-19 vaccines. And then lastly, in terms of treatment, we are in the process of developing an electronic clinical decision support tool to improve the management of patients who are hospitalized with lower respiratory tract infection. This is a tool that doctors in Sri Lanka would be able to use on their mobile phones. And there will be multiple data inputs that go into an algorithm, which is then translated to an app on the phone. And the data inputs would be real-time surveillance data on influenza and SARS coronavirus 2, patient features that are more suggestive of bacteria versus viral infection based on our repositories of data, and then performance and cost estimates from pathogen and biomarker tests that are available here, so like a rapid flu test or um, a CRP test. These data would be input into the algorithm, which would use machine learning techniques uh, to find out the pathways that maximize diagnostic accuracy while minimizing cost. And that would be translated to this app, which uh, we will then assess in a clinical trial next year at three public hospitals in Sri Lanka. And this trial um, is called Treat SL, and we are excited to be working on studies that may directly impact patient care here. In terms of acknowledgements, uh, I would like to acknowledge all the patients who have uh, been involved in our studies without whose generosity, none of this would be possible. The research staff of the Duke Ohne Collaborative Research Center, who have been the backbone and foundation of our work. The many collaborators and trainees over the years who have pushed forward our activities. And specifically from uh, the University of Lujene, I would like to acknowledge Professors Chuck Gavurinayake, Ajit Nagarwatha, and Masan Devasiri uh, for their expertise, for their infinite wisdom, and um, support in driving our work forward. And also from Lujene, I would specifically like to mention Dr. Rumi Kurukul Surya, Ms. Madhurika Prima Malik, Mr. Dilshan Gudlika, and Ms. Kavinia Vikramasinghe, who have again been instrumental uh, in moving our group's uh, work forward. And from Duke University, I would specifically like to acknowledge Professors Christopher Woods and Trulis Oswey for their mentorship, Dr. Maria Iglesias de Ossel and Dr. Bradley Nicholson, as well as the many others who are listed here. I would also like to acknowledge funding from the US National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, the Duke Global Health Institute, and the Hewitt Urban Center for Global Health. And finally, I would like to acknowledge my family, especially my parents and my dear friends and colleagues who have um, always provided unbearing support. So thank you very much, and thank you for your attention.